Hi, everybody, and thank you you once again for joining us for another educational webinar here from Fullscript. Um, I am pleased to be joined today by Dr. Alan Christensen. Um, Dr. Christensen is a naturopathic endocrinologist who focuses on thyroid function, specifically Hashimoto's hypothyroidism uh, and Graves disease. Uh, he's been actively practicing in Scottsdale since 1996 and is the founding physician behind Integrative Health. Uh, he is a New York Times bestselling author whose books include The Metabolism Reset Diet, The Adrenal Reset Diet, and The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease. Um, Dr. Christensen regularly appears on national media like Dr. Oz, The Doctors, um, The Today Show, and uh, he is the founding president behind the Endocrine Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Um, Dr. Alan Christensen, thank you so much for joining us and uh, take it away from here. Hey, Cameron. Thank you so much for that. Hey, and welcome. We got a good group here live and those who are hearing afterward, good to, good to be with you also. And really excited to, to share this. Now, just a quick thing about our format. There would be about a 50-minute discussion total, and I want to have some time for Q&A within that. So if you've got some questions, please enter them in. You've got the mechanisms for that with GoToWebinar. Uh, Cameron's graciously going to help out and cover ones that are more administrative for us, and I can focus on those that are more clinical. But it always you know, helps things hit home so much more when we can help this tie into your patients. My thought is that I'm going to focus on these after about 30 minutes of speaking and then just cover those in as much detail as we can. So yeah, pop in your questions. I want to help this make sense to your practice like today so you can use this right away and start making a difference because this is a super common condition that's affecting a lot of people. Okay, so fatty liver. So this is a discussion about really how this thing happens, you know, how common it is, and what we know about current interventions, a quick overview about dietary, supplemental lifestyle interventions, and what the efficacy we have to date is about that. So let's get in real quick on some of the details about just how prevalent this thing is. You know, the big picture of the prevalence is that it's a lot more than people suspect. We've got different ways of analyzing the prevalence of it. And there's, there's two different thoughts about diseases. You know, there's how well you can rule it in, and how well you can rule it out. You know, I'm looking out a window right now at the Sonoran Desert, and last week there was a rattlesnake that was outside this window, like just right out there hanging out, and so I had to haul him away. And last week in that moment, I could have looked and said, there are rattlesnakes that show up in my yard. I could have I had paused a definite rule in. I could have ruled in rattlesnakes by visual inspection of the yard. <laughs> but today I don't see any rattlesnakes, but that's not an adequate visual rule out. You know, it wouldn't be a logically valid point to say that there are no rattlesnakes in the surrounding desert, just because I don't see any right now. So that illustrates the difference between ruling things in and ruling things out. And this is a common issue in many medical conditions, especially this particular one. So there's a lot of ways in which people can see blatantly abnormal liver function, you know, when you're screening your patients. But in many cases, this can fly below the radar. And that's going to be relevant with our diagnostic discussion. But this is also completely relevant in terms of prevalence data, you know, prevalence based upon what metric. So if we look at elevation of liver enzymes, if we look at positive ultrasound, uh, all those things give us different numbers. And to date, there's no recommended screening procedures across the board, so that limits us as well. One of the things I saw that was pretty fascinating, uh, biopsy is the one definitive rule out for fatty liver because this really is a, a histologic disease. You know, diagnosis can be a specific finding like a broken bone or a definition of elevated blood pressure or diagnoses can be a constellation of symptoms. You know, we've got the syndromes, uh, fibromyalgia syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and you've got to have X number of symptoms or findings present. Or they can be histologic. So like Hashimoto's disease, for example, that's actually a histologic diagnosis. And the only rule out for that one also would be biopsy. But fatty liver truly is a histologic diagnosis. So there's many ways you can suspect it or clinically see that it's likely there but the only clear rule out would be biopsy. And the biopsy, its value in determining prevalence is limited because there's not many instances in which people that have 
no apparent liver problems receive liver biopsies. But the one exception to that is potential liver donors. So one larger study looked at potential liver donors, and they had to go through a series of hierarchical tests to rule out overt liver issues before they could donate tissue to a loved one. And that included blood markers of liver function, blood markers of glucose metabolism, also ultrasound screens for liver structure. And passing all those tests, the next step would be biopsy. And in cases just like that, healthy people that had not shown to be diabetic or have elevated transaminase or have abnormal liver ultrasounds, when they were biopsied, just shy of 40% were found to be ineligible to donate due to fatty liver syndrome. So that's where the 40% number comes from. I actually, I'm sorry, it was just over. It was actually 40.2% in that reference. And that was a biased population. That was those that didn't have any other signs. So it's, it's quite certain to say that it's more common than that, but we can say with a strong confidence that in adults, it's not less common than that. And there is some variance per age, per gender, per ethnicity, but really not a ton. So somewhere around a third of adults are probably running around with this. And this is a very relevant thing affecting their health, their concerns, their day-to-day -day symptoms. You know, and when you see patients, when would you think that this is likely? You know, what are some clues that would make you think you'd want to look more closely at their liver function? Well, the majority that have this really don't have any symptoms, you know, and some that do have symptoms that can be quite common. There's, there's a certain number of symptoms that upwards of, you know, 20 to 40% of us have at any given point in time. And these symptoms can fall into that category. So they may have issues of weight loss resistance. They may talk about having attempted many diets and either not having success or not having lasting success from their diets, or they may talk about unexplained weight gain. Those things can go together. And this is tough because you know, we hear a lot from data studying obesity trends that these things can occur for no medical reasons. You know, there, there definitely are scenarios in which our patient's intake doesn't really fit their memory. You know, sometimes we can have a disconnect between what we consume and what we think we do. And there are cases where there are legitimate medical reasons why weight doesn't respond in the way someone would expect, even if they're doing their due diligence. We can also see particular fatigue patterns and some of these can be vague or nonspecific. Something that's a little more targeted and more relevant is if there's big changes relative to meal timing and energy levels. So someone might talk about being especially wiped out if they miss a meal, or they might notice that their energy is better soon after a meal for brief windows of time, or they might notice that certain high fuel meals that are rich in carbohydrate, for example, may give them more energy, but not in a lasting sense. So there can be more specific versions of that. It's also rather common to see some gastrointestinal symptoms. And we can see the routine gas, bloating, discomfort. And a lot of these are going to come on sooner after meals, usually in the first few hours of mealtime. And that can be relevant to the liver's role in biliary excretion and its activity being heightened during this window, but typically more so upper gastrointestinal symptoms. And in many of these cases, you can find these and you may not see other explanations like you know, overt diabetes or thyroid disease or apnea. However, it's, it's a pitfall that I think we can fall under is to think that each situation, each person's concerns have a singular explanation. And in many cases, they do not. You know, it's quite common that we can have comorbidities, like in the case of both diabetes, thyroid disease, there's a large amount of statistical overlap both directions between those conditions and liver disease. So it's not so much you find the one thing that explains everything, you may often find several factors that are related. And sometimes they can have a causal relationship. Other times they can just be things that are quite prevalent in that same demographic. So many adults that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s that may have weight struggles can have these issues that can be co-occurring. And the relevance is that if you address one of those concerns but are not aware of any specialized needs or modifications due to underlying comorbidities, 
you may not yet see a full clinical response. So do think about ruling out other conditions when you're diagnosing and sorting out liver disease, but do know that it's not, it's not like a multiple choice test with one correct answer. You know, you can, you can have A and C, or you can even have all of the above in some cases. And one may be more central, but it's not uncommon to have comorbidities. And thankfully, we'll talk about interventional measures, you know, there's really nothing you do that's good for one part of your body that's counterproductive for another part in general lifestyle medicine. So that's the that's the positive side of that. So how do we make sense of this if we're seeing someone? When do we get suspicious? When do we start getting concerned about this being relevant? Well, here's some blood markers that are good things to clue someone in. So one of the most central of these is the first, and this is the ALT, the alanine amino transferase. This is among the more specific of the liver markers. So this is a uh, amino transferase. This is an enzyme that's involved in converting amino acids. And this is quite unique to liver cells. So the normal cycle is that liver cells regrow, old cells die off, and old cells die off, they pop open and they spill their contents into the systemic circulation. And the proportional amount of ALT in systemic circulation has a pretty strong linear tie to the rate of hepatocellular death. And some is perfectly healthy. You know, you've got old cells that are past their prime and they should go by the wayside so they can make room for new healthy cells. But when this number is above a, a threshold, I've seen 18 and I've also seen 19. I've seen that conflicted. But the upshot is that, especially for women, they can be well within the normal range, but not at a safe level. So there's strong agreements amongst the hepatology community that if you're a woman and you're above 18 or 19 in your ALT, that should be explained in some way. And you know, with differential diagnosis, there's many, many things that can cause that, uh, and they should be ruled out. So top of the list, we think about infectious hepatitis. We would think about autoimmune hepatitis. We've got varying iron overload conditions. We've got many other anti-inflammatory uh, states. But after ruling out some of those, it's quite common to see fatty liver emerge as the likely explanation, barring other factors. I should also mention medication reactions. And actually a fascinating thing I saw, uh, please do be involved with your patients and polypharmacy, being aware of them being on multiple medications, but also be aware of your patients in poly supplementation. You know, I'd highly encourage you to be involved with really all facets of their supplementation. You know, know and approve every pill they're on and encourage them to connect with you about any changes they tend to make. Uh, our populations, you guys know this, but you know, they're, they're often taking advice, not just from us, they're often also seeing things that are just recommended in line or through media, and they're trying things for a while and they cycle in and out of their lives. This is bizarre, but there's hard data saying that of those who report to emergency departments with acute liver damage, 20% of the time, it's caused by large numbers of supplements. And some of the ones that have triggered it are ones that surprise me, like if someone overdoses on green tea extract, for example, or it may be the combination. So I've, I've spoken to a friend who is a gastroenterologist, and I've also observed this in our own patient population, but it's not uncommon. Many patients will average 26 or more supplements per day. And there's a point at which even if every one of those 26 were probably fine, Somewhere along the way, 26 works different, you know, and the strain on the liver can be more pronounced. So always do think about that as a possible trigger as well. So back to serology, yeah, GGT, we see this above 30. And fasting glucose, you know, still normal, but above 90. Uh, many of you know about that being an early sign for diabetic risk, but also fatty liver, and these things overlap. And then also morning insulin levels elevating and edging up. Now the ALT, uh, guys, we've got a little more leeway on that. We think that it's not as relevant until we broach 30. But the normal range is not a gender specific range. And so both genders are said to be normal even when they're above these thresholds. So what is it that's actually going on? Well, there's a basic cycle and I'll talk about just the progression through these steps in a moment, but too much fat builds up in the liver. It's really, that's what's occurring. So when you think about fat, you know, a, 
a lean person, like a, a lean man is what, you know, 10, 12%, somewhere around there. Uh, a lean woman might be 20% in that range. So your liver is even, needs to be even leaner than that. When it hits 5%, it's sick. It's got problems. Now your liver is storing fuel in the form of glycogen and triglyceride. And, and it should, it needs to have both types present. But with fatty liver, basically the triglycerides have physically crowded out the space for glycogen. And there's a vicious cycle that ensues that can lead through these stages of fatty liver to steatohepatitis, uh, to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer and death. And here's about how that cycle plays out. So the glycogen triglyceride ratio, this is a ratio that's relevant to beta oxidation. So you need some glycogen in your liver to burn fat in your liver. And the storage, the, the, the gas tank size, so to speak, of glycogen is pretty finite. You know, you've got predefined glycogen vesicles that can hold on to glycogen, but when they're filled, that's it. So you run out of room quite quickly. Whereas triglyceride, the spaces are not predefined and they can build up within cells outside of designated organelles. And they can also build up between cells. We've got the intra and the intercellular um, steatohepatitis that forms. And the cycle that takes place is that when there's too much present, then it crowds out the room for glycogen and the existing compartments set aside for it become just physically compressed and crowded out. And without glycogen, beta, operate, beta oxidation can no longer operate. And in, in having that happen, that doesn't mean the body cannot any longer burn fuel, but it does, it does mean that it cannot do so via beta oxidation. And at that point, triglycerides that would be burned are then converted to ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies can be used outside the liver in a variety of areas for sure, uh, but hepatocytes cannot use them. Hepatocytes cannot burn ketones for fuel. So liver cells are starved for fuel. And the drawback about that is they need to use energy to light the match, so to speak, to break down stored energy. And this vicious cycle means there's more triglycerides because they can't, they don't have the energy to mine this stuff and light it up. You know, they can't get it going and they can't spark the match, so to speak. And so you can see now how triglycerides are building up, but they can't break down. And this cycle perpetuates itself. So that's a big drawback. And we'll talk later about dietary intervention. And having this model in mind is helpful in understanding about the role of various types of dietary fuel, you know, carbs, fats, ketones. And I'll argue later on that a healthy diet for fatty liver is probably a healthy diet in general. And it probably should include some amount of all the macronutrients. You know, in an absence of carbohydrate, it wouldn't necessarily improve the liver's fat burning. It would just heighten the rate of triglyceride accumulation. That, that's at least a mechanistic thought behind that. So I mentioned how this is on a continuum. And there's also evidence that this prevalence is on the rise. You know, our rates of, of general obesity have correlated with fatty liver, but there's another level to that. So, you know, we define obesity and overweight as a function of body weight, uh, height relative to weight. What we're seeing is that body weight strongly predicts fatty liver, but not that perfectly. Uh, there's been many people who have been found to have healthy BMI scores, their body weight is fine, but they're still seeing these metabolic issues like fatty liver or diabetes form. And for quite a while, it was a conundrum as to why this was happening. And it was a real, a real difficulty because it seemed so evident that therapies that could engender healthy, sustained weight loss could improve these conditions. But what do you do about people that don't need to lose weight? That was a real, a real conundrum. And further analysis saw that when you take the population of people that are developing these conditions and are of a healthy body weight, and you do a good close look via imaging at body composition, it turns out that, well, their body weight is fine, but their body fat content is not. And we're also learning that there's compartments, uh, deeper compartments to body fat. Everyone's heard about the, the dangerous belly fat, this is kind of a bizarre concept, but 
it turns out that the belly fat is a protective mechanism. And the more someone can make that, the less apt they are to have fat accumulate in the liver. So what occurs is that when the body's in a state of excess fuel, and by fuel, I would say anything that breaks down into oxaloacetate, so carbs, fats, ketones, even alcohol, and alcohol can be a little harder in some ways than others to, to utilize, but any excess fuel state, you've got to do something with it. You know, if you can't burn it right then and there, you've got to put it somewhere. And the most benign place you could put it would be in subcutaneous fat, but there's limits on how well you can form that in terms of uh, microvasculature, angiogenesis, in terms of uh, septal cell formation. And so the overflow from there is in that visceral fat. But then visceral fat also has its limitations on uh, cellular hyperplasia and cellular hypertrophy. And once the, the space and the rate of growth is tapped out in visceral fat, the overflow then becomes the liver. And that's when we're seeing this disease build up. So there's some people, for whatever reason, that are able to safely get fat more than others, meaning they can put the same amount of fuel, more of it in subcutaneous fat or in visceral fat. Whereas someone else at that same amount of fuel, more of it ends up in the liver. But when you do imaging that looks at body composition at an organ level, you see that fatty liver disease and these metabolic issues correlate with total body fat, you know, the, the total body fat burden, which again, doesn't always correlate with scale weight. I'll talk a bit about waist circumference being an easy predictor of that. But once this fat is built up in the liver, the first stage is really subclinical fatty liver. And that's where you're not at that 5%. There's not necessarily clinical findings, but you're heading towards that. And that's what may be showing up at the earliest sign of the deviation of some of those serum markers, the ALT or the fasting glucose. And about 10 to 40% of the time, this can progress to NASH. And at the stage of NASH, it's not just that there's a whole lot of fat in the liver, it's that there's a whole lot of fat and it's really inflamed. There's a lot of free radical formation that the body is not able to stay on top of and manage. And this NASH often leads to fibrosis. And this inflammation is basically leading to calcification. So you're getting cells that are uh, bonded together. They're, they're glycated. They're, they're no longer freely mobile. And when that occurs, 25% of the time when there's fibrosis, this can then lead to cirrhosis. And what's distinct about the stage of cirrhosis is that the cells are so fibrous that they're dying in ways that also harms their neighbors. So this is like um, nuclear fission, so to speak, where you've got one uranium atom that's been, been split, it's breaking apart, and it's causing the same to occur to its adjacent atoms. So yeah, you've got one liver cell or one group of liver cells that are so inflamed and so damaged and so fibrous that they cause localized chemical trauma that harms adjacent cells, which are probably vulnerable. They're probably not at their best state going into that. And this by itself can be a cause of, of death by just impaired liver function. And some data says that in the coming decade, in the coming few years, this may be edging up into the top five causes of human death because there's really a big wave of this disease that's hitting critical mass in adulthood and adolescence. The other thought is hepatocellular carcinoma. And really all stages of this continuum, we see higher rates of primary liver cancer. You know, of course the liver is a common site of secondary metastasis, but cancers can start here as well because of the rate of high cell turnover and chronic inflammation. So if you're seeing someone and you're seeing these suspicious scores, well, what do you do about that? Well, you can stage that as a first step. And this is the uh, a formula called the fatty liver index that's been clinically validated. Um, uh, here's the math, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not sure if I could sort out this math longhand myself, but honestly, there's a lot of online calculators for fatty liver index. Just punch in fatty liver index calculator. And what you do, you'll plug in BMI, waist circumference, GGT, and triglycerides. So you just need those three numbers. <laughs> if you're, I'm sure a lot of you are better with math than I am. You can do that longhand if you like, but you don't need to. So once you plug those in, you're going to get a score something like this. And if your score is below 30, the likelihood of that patient having fatty liver is pretty negligible. You know, you can honestly dismiss it past that point. So even if you're seeing an equivocal ALT score, 
but their FLI, throwing a lot of acronyms around here, but their fatty liver index is less than 30, they would not need for their diagnostic work in that purpose. However, a lot of these people, you will see that their fatty liver index will be in this indeterminate range, this 30 to 60 range. And at that point, it becomes a clinical judgment on your first step. If you were seeing a low level of suspicion otherwise, it's quite reasonable to proceed with an ultrasound as a, as a first step. You also do want to rule out other causes of chronic liver inflammation, and I mentioned some of those. Uh, the ultrasound has the value of detecting when there is 30% fibrosis present. However, it does not rule out milder disease. So a normal ultrasound in someone that's indeterminate, you cannot rule out fatty liver disease. And it would be reasonable to proceed with lifestyle recommendations if there were no other indications of there being advanced disease. If you're seeing their score greater than 60, they really do need a biopsy for, for definitive staging and then further treatment evaluation opportunities. So I mentioned just a bit of, before about how the only clear rule out is that biopsy, and that's really just done as a screen for liver donors. But this was the study talking about that. And apparently it was 38.5. So 40.2 is a number I had incorrect, but quite prevalent when you do screen people, even healthy people by biopsy. So this is a tool you should be aware of. It's, it is an invasive test, but it's really a worthwhile test because that's the way you can see how advanced the disease is. The drawback is that the ALT and the serum markers, they're helpful ways to see if someone is likely to be carrying the disease, but they're not consistent for really stratifying the the degree of disease progression. You could have someone that's quite a ways in that continuum, even if their ALT score is just high normal. So when you've got a high fatty liver index, it's worth really having them do a biopsy to see how far along the disease is. So what are the things we know that give rise to this? Well, there's a few known nutritional drivers. Uh, some of those can be just low levels of key nutrients. And most any micronutrient you can shake a stick at can be relevant. So we'll see things like magnesium or zinc being quite common. Uh, those who are malabsorbing nutrients that are missing out on B12, even iron malabsorption can be a part behind this. And amino acids, so not so much just protein, but essential amino acids. Uh, super brief aside, uh, collagen proteins, oftentimes people use those as protein supplements. If you get deep in the amino acid composition, they're really lacking in essential amino acids. So a lot of people argue that they should not be considered protein at all. But that was a quick soapbox that I'll get, get off of. Uh, diets that are quite low in glucose. So we mentioned about the role of glycogen. So glycogen comes from glucose. You can make glucose from non-glucose non, um, sources. So you can definitely convert proteins into glucose just fine. But you can't convert proteins into glycogen. You can't make glucose quickly enough to have an abundance of it to store within the liver cells. So if there's too little healthy sources of glucose, like you could get from vegetable starches, from intact whole grains, from beans and legumes, from, from fruits, all these foods have good amounts of glucose. These are ways in which the body can then store glycogen. Uh, selenium also quite relevant. Folate can be important. And for many that can have methylation defects, folic acid can inhibit the positive effects of folate in terms of uh, natural folates in supplementation and natural folates in the diet. And then one last thing we've seen, there's a lot of data about DHA being a driver. And kind of a paradox is that the more fat someone consumes, the harder time they may have forming DHA. You know, we can of course get DHA preformed via dietary fish, um, a little tiny bit from grass-fed meats or game meats, and then also from fish oil supplements. But our body does also convert ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, into DHA via delta-60 saturates. But the paradox is that the more total fat we consume, the less available delta-60 saturates is available for that conversion. So those on higher fat diets overall are more apt to be lower in DHA than those who are not. So Here's a couple of interventions I wanna talk about, and we're gonna open up to questions in just a minute or two. So saliva's been studied a fair amount, and the data is the data's mixed. I would say that the net data is positive, but it's, it is mixed, and there are some mechanistic models making it a concern. In one of the largest recent studies, they were comparing actual stores of fibrosis 
uh, after the course of a 40-week period with a blinded study. And what they saw was that the placebo did also improve fibrosis scores and salivum did as well, but not better than placebo, so quite similar. And the benefit is that saliva may lower the rate of cell death, but the concern we're seeing is that it may be working via hormetic mechanisms. So what that means is that it may help the liver by subtly irritating the liver and therefore causing it to speed up its rate of cell repair. And we're, we're just not certain if that's a helpful mechanism in the case of a chronic inflammatory state or not. So there are some questions about that. And really, anything we do that's not addressing the fuel overload may not have the lasting desired effects. Uh, we've got a fair amount of data on vitamin E, and this is probably one of the areas that has the most amount of positive outcomes. To be really precise, the positive data is most strong amongst diabetics and also amongst pediatric populations. In the studies, they were using higher dose, and they really were using alpha tocopherol as well. There's a lot of emerging positive science about the blended tocopherols and tocotrienols and the relevance of other tocopherols, like the gamma tocopherols, having some importance. But the whole time lag between emerging concepts and setting up research, you know, they're on different cycles. So these studies were set up prior to a lot of those ideas being emergent. And we know that uh, alpha tocopherol by itself has had these effects in those populations. Now, some of these were used in conjunction with ursodiol, which is basically a prescription bare bile extract. And those showed more consistent effects in adult populations when evaluated via follow-up biopsy. We've also had some data on NAC. Our human evidence is limited. There is some pretty encouraging data from animal studies and mechanistic models. There's some positive data arguing that it may benefit glutathione production and it is known to limit damage from reaction, reactive oxygen species in those hepatocytes. So maybe a useful thing, um, a bit more to learn about that still. And um, one last item that I didn't have on here was Ganoderma. We've also got a moderate amount of evidence suggestive of benefit by the use of Ganoderma, AKA reishi extracts. And they're used in isolation or in the context of mushroom blends. And I mention them, even though the data is not as strong, just because of the high degree of relative safety. You know, the thought of mechanism is really not through any type of hormesis or localized harm. The, the mechanism of actions of mushroom extracts are quite benign. And the degree of therapeutic index, meaning how close a harmful dose is to a therapeutic dose, is so broad that I would argue that even if evidence is not as strong, they could be given a relevant clinical trial because of their generalized salutary benefits and lack of overt harm. So we think now about other lifestyle interventions. And we've got a lot of really strong evidence on the benefits of exercise. And when we get down to the molecular mechanisms of how this fuel overload is harming the liver, you know, exercise acts on every one of those pathways in positive ways. And I've looked closely at which types, you know, because our patients, in many cases, they're not already doing what they would consider to be optimal exercise. And it's a struggle to make lasting change for a large number of people. So the question is, you know, what's the minimal effective dose? You know, which type can they do the least of and get the most benefit? And if they are picking and choosing, which one would be most effective? Well, if you look at the sum total of literature, we see benefits from really all these main types of aerobic resistance exercise and also interval training. They've all shown various types of benefits. There was one, one study that did a comparative analysis on the effects of aerobic exercise versus resistance exercise. And they showed that aerobic training had a greater effect on transaminase scores after a 12 week period. So that was one of the few comparative studies. Uh, in most cases, the the meta-analysis uh, or the organized reviews will not see a clear advantage of one type over another. Most will really suggest a combination of these things for those that are amenable to it. If someone is not doing any exercise, any amounts they do will serve them. If they are exercise, exercising currently and they're game to modify that in ways to improve their liver, most recommendations talk about doing some type of an aerobic activity on most days 
and then once or twice per week, including interval training and resistance training. So we'll talk about diets. And the pitfall here is that a simple caloric deficit alone, just eating less, if someone did do that effectively, that alone could be counterproductive. And not all cases of simple food restriction end up being beneficial. We talked about the need for glucose to form glycogen. If there is a loss of key micronutrients, one can see an impairment of detoxification mechanisms. And if there's a real big gap in foods that maintain satiety and blood sugar, we can see greater demands on gluconeogenesis and greater amounts of cortisol liberated to spur glucose from stores. And then if someone does achieve effective rapid weight loss, they may have a fair amount of uric acid liberated, which can also be counterproductive. So these are some of the pitfalls to bear in mind with dietary therapy is that those things can counter the benefit to liver function. So these are ways by where someone could lose weight and have their liver end up being less healthy from it. So here's some things that have been studied and some generalized thoughts about them. Uh, fructose itself, you know, it's, it's thought of as being a, a dangerous substance and by all means in the state of fuel overload, it completely is. Especially in its liquid states, we see that there can be harm from that. I wish PowerPoint did a better job with spell check. <laughs> I'm seeing some, some spelling errors, my apologies. Uh, but the issue with fructose really seems to be in the context of fuel overload and in highly processed food. There's been quite a bit of evidence looking at the role of fruit in the diet and its relevance to fatty liver. There's just no harm from fruit. So yeah, liquid fructose and honestly, high fructose corn syrup versus sugar, the differences are so small at a molecular level, they're really not relevant. Just any way in which there's this fuel overload that's quickly absorbed. Dietary cholesterol has been shown to be a driver. So diets that are higher in total cholesterol can be relevant. Here's a pretty bizarre paradox for people, but those with celiac disease that after initial diagnosis go gluten-free, they end up having a higher risk of developing fatty liver. And that goes along with the common trend of weight gain in those who have celiac and go gluten-free. It's been speculated about quite a bit. They may be malabsorbing less. They may be shifting their diet in terms of total fiber intake or processed food intake. But a real pitfall is that those that go gluten-free that have celiac disease may be at greater risk during that transition time. And of course, there's net benefit to their health, but this is a consideration. Now, another thought about the diet is where do these fat, where these triglycerides come from that get into the liver cells? And the data suggests that 26% or less comes from de novo lipogenesis, meaning converted from carbohydrate. So we often hear the trope that sugar turns to fat. Well, that's de novo lipogenesis, and it, it certainly does happen, but it's a lot easier for fat to turn to fat. And, and actually the biggest source of circulating triglycerides is just normal turnover of adipocytes. So like liver cells, fat cells are always turning over. They're spilling out triglycerides and reabsorbing triglycerides. And almost all triglycerides in circulation are either from liberated fat cells or just taken straight into the circulation via the lymphatic system from, from the diet or the portal vein directly from, from dietary fats, which are not converted. So you do make some from carbohydrate, but it really is the minority. And in dietary intervention, fat versus carbohydrate, there's never been data relative to liver disease saying that one has a big advantage over the other. So I would argue that both elements are important in the diet, especially when we consider the role of glucose and the benefits of fiber. If one restricts carbohydrate too much, then you can get short in those ways. We do see that there is a role for protein sparing, and that was the relevance of amino acids, also benefits to body composition. We see no clear data yet on ketogenic diets having an advantage. There is some mechanistic data suggesting that they may be counterproductive, and that was back to the hepatocytes not being able to burn ketones. And then last up, there's been a few papers looking at hypocaloric diets versus isocaloric Mediterranean diets. And the question there is how much is it by lowering the food intake and how much is it by going on a more anti-inflammatory diet? And it seems that the isocaloric Mediterranean diets are helping more so in ways of cardiovascular and inflammatory markers, but it seems that it does take some deficit, some caloric deficit to really benefit liver function. Uh, this is the last book I put out. And in this, I talked about a way you can do a liver supportive protein sparing modified fast. 
So you're doing a window of 28 days in which you're getting adequate micronutrients, you know, pretty good variety of healthy foods, but you're allowing the liver to do a better job tapping into those stored triglycerides and really not talking about one fuel as being good or bad, but having a lower amount be total. And making it to where it's a window of time. You go in, you do this for this window of time, and afterwards you finish and you do a more maintenance program between those cycles. But we've done a clinical trial, this can work well. And I really pulled together all the best known practices on ways to help the liver by going on a hypochloric diet, but not to be counterproductive for it. So, and a quick last point when you're watching your clients, think about weight loss versus waste loss. When someone's moving in the right direction, they're gonna see more dramatic waste loss than they might see weight loss. So a typical weight loss might be four to seven pounds per every inch of body weight lost. But if it's working well for liver function, you'll often see an inch come off for every one or two pounds of weight loss. So really big difference. You'll see more waste loss than you would typically. Okay, so I wanted to have some time for questions. Let me go into the area here and see what we've got. Okay, I'm gonna open up this window and make this bigger. All right, so this is the one uh, from Jennifer. Is it true that fructose is harder in your liver than other sugars? Yeah, so this is a great question. I just very briefly touched on that. And the consensus is that any kind of fuel, once you're above your fuel balance, gets to be, gets to be harmful. And by fuel, this could be any kind of a fat, whether it's polyunsaturated, saturated, monounsaturated, any kind of a carbohydrate, regardless if it's simple or complex. Uh, also, any kind of ketones, whether they're endogenous or exogenous, and then alcohol. So all those things, the common thread is that they're ultimately broken down into oxaloacetate. And when the body's in a high fuel state, oxaloacetate has to go down storage mechanisms. Once the body tips the threshold to a low fuel state, oxaloacetate is burned via mechanisms of the mitochondria especially. But at that high fuel state, there's more storage taking place. And the pitfall is that when someone cannot safely store that fuel elsewhere in other compartments, then you're seeing that store inside the liver and especially between the liver cells. And the vicious cycle is you can reach a state in which you've got too much triglyceride, but not enough glycogen to burn triglyceride. And Fructose can contribute to that, but some of the studies, they've primarily been animal studies, they've shown that once you're at an isochloric state, even a 20% fructose diet in a rat model will not induce fatty liver. But once you go a hair above an isochloric state, then any extra fructose can do that, but also any extra uh, saturated fat can do that. So if, if someone's diet really was just reasonable, but they drink a lot of soda on top of it, they could cut that off the top of their diet and radically improve their health. But someone else, if their diet was reasonable, they had a fair amount of fruit in the diet, they could take away the wrong message. They could think, oh, if fructose is bad, I need to cut this out. And that might be a rich source of fiber and micronutrients. So ultimately it is fuel overload. That's the biggest issue. Another question here from a different Jennifer, it looks like this is, how does doing regular liver cleanses improve fatty liver disease? Yeah, great question. And I guess tricky one to answer easily because uh, there's a big diverse range of what a liver cleanse is. So some that involve more full food restriction and especially protein restriction, there are some possible pitfalls of lacking in conjugating amino acids. So in the program I put together in the metabolism reset diet, I assured that even though the fuel intake was lower, that the amount of conjugating compounds was still adequate for a good liver function. Another one, does desiccated liver assist fatty liver disease? So dietary ingestion of desiccated liver, I've not seen data either way. Uh, the amounts of that consumed are rather small. It's quite dense in micronutrients. There are times to where iron overload can be a problem in terms of liver function. So that can be a negative about it. The overall protein content is small, but really just seeing no data either way. Here's a question from Kobe. How can you test for that? So Kobe, I think that you, you asked that question early along, and I think we did cover that a bit more about screening and final diagnosis. 
Uh, Jennifer, coffee enemas do anything to reduce fatty liver disease? You know, no data I've seen. So there's always like three levels of data. There's mechanistic models, there's epidemiologic data, and then interventional data. And mechanistically, the idea about a lot of caffeine hitting the liver quickly, the concern is that you might induce a greater amount of phase one activity relative to phase two activity and final conjugation. So that's where higher caffeine intake is thought to be counterproductive in liver function. And when it comes in straight to the portal vein, that could be more pronounced. Um, here's a question. I'm not seeing all of it just yet. Let me adjust the screen. So I can see all this question, if I can. Oh, here we go. Uh, patients on medication, insights on how to support liver without interactions with medication. Yeah, tricky thing with polypharmacy. Uh, no easy answers. There, there certainly are known nutrient depletion pathways for various nutrients. So the trick in those cases is making sure that they're not on unnecessary medications. And then if they are, whatever they're on, doing minimal but adequate micronutrient support to keep them from developing micronutrient deficiency secondary to that. Uh, how do full glycogen stores lead to inability to use glycogen? So really, that's not the problem. So full glycogen isn't the issue. It's more so depleted glycogen showing up. Here's one from Luca. Why are we seeing fatty liver in our children? increasing amounts, what could be contributing? It's a great question, Luca. And this is the, really parallels the question about the whole obesity epidemic. And there's some combination of fuel overload, um, obesogens, obesogens that we're exposed to, and disruptors of our circadian rhythm, and then alterations of our body's HPA axis. So it's some mixture of that. And we're seeing that it's worse amongst kids and it's progressing. And we're seeing fatty liver quite prevalent in pediatric populations. Oh yeah, here's a great point from Jennifer about uh, increasing ferritin over women being a sign. Yes, it definitely can be a sign. The number 150, I've not seen that particular number. It could be. I've most commonly seen higher numbers like greater than 200 or 250 being a relevant indicator. But yes, uh, chronic liver inflammation can skew ferritin and leave more ferritin in circulation as a secondary effect of the chronic inflammation. So another thing you may see on screening would be high ferritin in the absence of other markers of iron overload. And that does point toward that. Um, HCG infections, of, uh, injections, how do they affect fatty liver disease? Well, the HCG itself, I wouldn't know of any direct mechanisms it has. They're really done in the context of a 500 calorie per day diet. And such dramatic weight loss diets have a higher risk for death, to be frank. Uh, when you're that low in food, it can be harder than, as far as your protein deficits, than just not than just even overtly fasting. So I've just not seen data suggesting harm or help, but mechanistically, I've not seen data suggesting those diets are superior to other diets for lasting weight loss. Here's a comment about sunflower lecithin. Yeah, I've seen some data on phosphatidylcholine. I've not seen that really show up in the larger uh, organized data reviews, but I've seen some isolated data on that possibly being of some benefit. Here's a question about resistant starch. Yeah, in the book you said you can get resistant starch from cooled rice, but if you reheat it, do you lose that? Awesome question. Actually, no. <laughs> so you cook and cool. Uh, potatoes are the big winners for this. And if you cook and cool them repeatedly, they'll keep on forming more of that and you don't lose that. So that's cool. Here's one, does saturated fat have greater implications for progression of disease than other fats? Uh, more so general storage triglycerides, thanks. To be really precise, when I was talking about fructose and any kind of a fuel at an overload state, the study showed that if you overloaded the fuel by 20% of fructose, you could cause X amount of damage, but you could also get that damage by just 10% overload in saturated fat. So it may be a bit worse from, from some of those animal models, but it's really still in the context of fuel overload. I've not seen data arguing that a certain amount of saturated fat in the context of fuel balance is inherently harmful. Um, question about caprylic acid directly burned. I've seen no data either way. I just don't know. And someone, can you expand on protein sparing points? Sure. So the general idea there, protein sparing in the context of weight loss, you'll see some differing numbers in the book. To make it simple, I talked about about a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. Some will talk about like 
7.8 grams per pound of total body weight. Yeah, I tried to think about like just lean body mass and about a gram per pound for easy math for people. So say you've got a woman who's 140 pounds and she's 20% uh, body fat. I use that for easier math. <laughs> that would put her at about 110 grams. So when she's going less than that for protein, her body may have a harder time with having proteins available for conjugating compounds. So it does take some thought to get that level of protein in the context of a low fuel diet. And that was a big part that, of what I covered in there in the book. Um, effect that it has on conjugation pathways. So it's a great question there about fatty liver and conjugation. So people can be different in how their various pathways are affected. And I'm not sure that's, we know ways in which to make that clinically relevant, but as a generalization, in many cases, you'll see phase one activity overtake phase two conjugation. So as a general principle, one does want to avoid phase one inducers and then maintain good amounts of healthy conjugation. Another question about coffee, I did mention that. Uh, this is a question, high HDL indicated liver problem. You know, awesome question. I don't know that, that's quite plausible. I've seen a lot of data arguing now that HDL levels that high do correlate with substantial cardiovascular risk, especially for women. So I don't know that pertaining to liver function, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Question about collagen proteins, are they absorbed from that collagen proteins may not be may not be bioavailable. Yeah, you can take a peek at amino acid profiles for collagen supplements, they're not secret. And if you look at those and you look at a protein, a corrected protein digestibility score, amino acid score, collagen rates at exactly zero. You know, you'll see how uh, dairy or animal proteins, egg or whey can be in the 100 range or just above that. Beef protein might be in the 90s. Vegetable proteins can be in the 80s or 90s. Uh, Grain protein as an isolate can be in the 70s, and collagen protein comes back at a big goose egg, like it's totally zero. So if someone is lacking in protein and they add collagen to their diet, they're not improving the protein status. They may be worsening it. There's data arguing that if you consume more non-essential amino acids in the absence of essential amino acids, you may be better off not consuming any. Okay, besides diet, other types of supplements with adolescents, I think that came in yeah, the best data on adolescents really was on that, on vitamin E. Olivia asked about role of food sensitivities in fatty liver. Fair question. I've not seen data either way on that. Uh, patients without a pituitary gland and on thyroid therapy, difference between patients with a pituitary related liver detox. Wow. So a patient who has no pituitary output, they need quite extensive hormone replacement just across the board. You know, all their glands will be underperforming by lack of stimulating uh, overseeing hormones. So you'd see FSH, TSH, ACTH, LH, all suppressed. And they really need across the board replacement therapy to be safe. And that state itself, uncorrected, would have huge effects upon every known pathway. Even well corrected, I'm sure there could be some compromises. But as far as specific data on that, really, I would know of none. The main goal would be to have them as close to a normal endocrine state as possible via their supplementation. Uh, experience with berberine, dose and duration. Yeah, you know, just short version of this, I've seen some data on it being of some benefit. The cool thing is that in the context of effective weight loss and protein sparing weight loss, it can be very, very corrective. The liver can really heal. And I'm, I'm thank you for these questions because I, I failed to really make that clear enough is that in the vast majority of these cases, the liver can regenerate, can heal, can regain its function just by targeting that weight loss from the liver tissue itself. Okay, let me get just a couple more. I've got to wrap up in one more minute. Uh, I won't be able to get to all of these, unfortunately. Uh, cholecystectomy affect cleansing of the liver. You know, for sure it can be a factor in terms of just fat absorption, fat mobilization. And main thing there is really just minimizing bolus fat intake and having fat be well emulsified in foods and spread out throughout the day. Um, testing such as fibro scan, monitoring disease progression. Yeah, thank you. I've actually seen data on that in the prior years, but not seeing it discussed in more recent reviews. I think that we're really just waiting to learn a bit more about that. And let me grab one last one. Um, sounds like an isochloric diet combined with a moderate amount of glucose from good carbs 
are important in reversing fatty liver, best evidence that be correct. That would be correct. I would tag in the protein sparing, and that's really the best thing that we're seeing going for that. So I'm gonna close the question window. And that was the event. I saw some really positive feedback in the questions and thank you for those who just thought to mention that. I appreciate the feedback and good to connect with you guys and share this. But yeah, thank you for your time and attention. Mm -hmm.